Welcome back to the final episode of the We Play series hosted by Swim Ireland, proudly partnered with Sport Ireland and Connecticut. I am delighted to welcome back to our panel this afternoon, Mona McSharry, Nicola Friday and Ulton Delan. You're all welcome back. So we've had loads of questions come in for the panelists following the release of our initial interview. We're going to start with a, a light-hearted question, maybe, and ask you, each of you, what is the favourite thing about your particular sport? And I'm going to go to you, Alton, first. Um, the favourite thing about rugby for me is the competition of playing, just uh, just playing with your best friends against another team and just the, the feeling of competing and, and, and overcoming uh, other good teams. I think, that's, I think that's why we play the sport, and it's, uh, it's a really good feeling when you win as a team. And Mona, coming over to you. Um, well, I can't deny, you know, I love to win, of course. But I think for me personally, as well as winning, even in training and stuff, when you do a really, really hard session, that feeling of kind of having finished it and gotten through it and just feeling really good, that I love that feeling kind of sets me up for the whole day. So I would say being able to do that as much as I can within training and competition is probably what I love most. And Nicola, finally to you. Um, I think it's probably, um, it's definitely my teammates. Um, I've been lucky. I've been involved in kind of a few different clubs the last few years. I've moved around a bit and I can say in every single one of them, I've made like friends that I'm going to have for life. So that's definitely one of the big things for me. So fantastic with the team sport that you do get to have that camaraderie and and your uh, the friendships that you have and the bonds for life that you have with people as well. Interestingly, Mona, you mentioned your training um, and how doing a really hard session and uh, getting through it and completing it is, is part of the excitement of your sport as well. But tell me, what is your favorite training session? Honestly, anything that makes me burn, I would say. Like, I'm not a fan of just getting in to swim the miles and get that done. Like, like my coach always says, every session is going to have a sting in the tail. You know, it might be a shorter little burst, but I kind of love just any session that makes me feel horrible, pretty much. <laughs> I wouldn't say I have a specific favorite. So when you go training, you know, what's the, the session that you least look forward to then, I guess? Uh, anything over maybe three, four hundred meter sets, anything threshold, pretty much. Uh, I'm not a fan of the long distance stuff. I'm a sprinter <clears throat> at heart. <laughs> and then coming back down to uh, Alton and Nicola, um, in terms of your own training, what is the, I suppose, the hardest session that the coach will set you? And I'll go to Nicola first. Um, I think it's whenever you're kind of away from the team environment, whenever you're like at home for Christmas or stuff like that and you're doing the conditioning blocks and they're like physically and mentally draining because you don't have your teammates around you to keep like push you on it's all about like your with your willpower kind of so they're definitely one of the ones I struggle with anyways and Alton coming across to you yeah no I, I agree conditions definitely the toughest uh, for us it'd be Preseason in uh, in our preseason training, we the, the coaches like to push uh, the players to their limits, and uh, yeah, there's always some new uh, sadistic way of uh, drilling us every summer, and uh, it's pretty grueling. It's enjoyable because you're with the team, but uh, it's pretty horrible at the time. But there is something very satisfying about getting that session, looking at it, thinking it's absolutely horrendous, and then nailing it. Because there is a definite sense of self-satisfaction, whether you're with your teammates or whether you're training on your own, it does make a big difference because that self-satisfaction is part of the self-motivation. And Mona, you probably, out of all of the athletes, uh, train on your own the most. Um, so how do you self-motivate and self-regulate to have that discipline to get into the pool on those dark, dreary mornings and work out those sessions? Um, yeah, it's, it's definitely difficult. I kind of try and just set targets for myself, so I'm not then thinking as much about the session but more about you know the little targets that I'm trying to hit and then even if I get out of the session and I wasn't happy with how it went at least I know that I hit those little targets so it wasn't you know that I got out and just hate the fact that the session wasn't good but at the same time kind of once I get in I just kind of switch into auto mode and then until I'm done I'm not getting out of the pool so I'm quite lucky that I have that kind of mindset to just like the only option is to finish it that's kind of the way I think. So um, yeah, that's 
that's what I would do anyway. <laughs> And of course, in Ireland, for swimming, indoor swimming, weather doesn't really affect your training sessions. But Ulton and Nicola, the weather can play havoc with your motivation to get outside to train. I mean, the west of Ireland is not the driest, warmest place in the country. What are you thinking when it's absolutely lashing rain outside and you're lacing up the boots and putting on the gear and getting out on the pitch? Ulton, we'll come to you first. Uh, it's... it's uh... It's part, of, it's part of playing here, I suppose. It's horrible. <laughs> so, so <laughs> it can be absolutely awful. Where, just that day where, where it turns and you're waking up and it feels like minus, minus one, minus two degrees and it's hailstones raining. The backs have to do their, their walk through in the gym and us, the forwards, have to go out, do line outs, mauling and then scrums and it's, it's horrific. But uh, that's just part of it. That we we know when we when we put pen to paper that you're signed up for three years of, for at least a month or two, you, you're gonna you're gonna have that weather. The, the Aussies hate it, but uh, <laughs> takes uh, it takes a bit of getting used to. And Nicola, what about you? Going out into the into the muck in the middle of the pitch, and there's muck and dirt and everything flying everywhere. But it's a fast game on a day. Um, you know, what's it like going out training or or, or competing and playing a match in horrendous weather? When the ball wouldn't even stay in your hands, it's so slippery. You kind of nearly have to break it down into like 10 minutes. So like when you get out there, you're like, right, if I get through the first 10 minutes, you're kind of nearly acclimatised to the weather. But um, yeah, it's just about kind of making like just focusing on like the little things. So like focusing on like getting around the corner or catching the ball, like and just breaking it down kind of very simply whenever simply. you're dealing with like that. Do you have to play any tricks with your mind to convince yourself it's a good idea to go out in the hailstones? You know, how do you convince yourself that it's the right decision to do to go out in the rain and the wind? And I just make sure, like, I tell myself that everyone else is doing it, or else, like, the players that I'm going to come up against, like, in, against other countries, are doing the exact same thing. So that kind of nearly pushes you out the door because you don't want to be the person that skipped that session because of the weather. <laughs> Yeah. And have you have you always been competitive, Alton? Have you been competitive throughout your whole life? Um, yeah, I grew up. My brother is a year older than me, so uh, we uh, always did the same sports growing up. So really naturally competitive through that. Uh, tried our hands at different sports, but uh, yeah, I like to. I think I think I'm quite competitive. I think so. Uh, yeah, I have to say. Yeah. I'm going to come back up to uh, to talk to you, Mona, and talk about um, some of the adventures you might have been on as an international <laughs> swimmer. What's the biggest and best adventure you've ever been on, whether that's been for a competition or just on holidays? Um, I'd say probably my favourite trip ever was when we went in 2018, we went to the Seti Colli Tour, which is in Rome. Uh, and we did about a week's training um, just outside of Rome and we got to go into the city centre and do some sightseeing and I'd never been to Italy and it was always a country that I wanted to visit and then after that we competed um, in Rome for I think maybe two three days but it was in a, a spectacular outdoor pool it was just a really really nice experience and I think I just like when I think back there's only happy memories from that trip and I think I just really enjoyed that one the most although I've been to so many different crazy countries that I probably wouldn't step foot in without swimming so it's kind of hard to even pick one. Do you find sometimes with the competition that you're traveling to all these amazing places but you actually don't really get the time to have some downtime and, and go and visit them? Yeah that that is probably the worst part because like I do love to travel and see different countries and you really you arrive at the airport, you travel to the hotel and then you go to the pool and, you know, you're so focused on being the best athlete you can be that you're not really going to take a full day trip walking around to try and see stuff, which is a pity. Um, but I guess it's just part of the sport. And, you know, the countries that I have gone to I, nearly makes me want to go back just so I can actually see them in more detail. And Nicola, if there was one place in the world that you'd love to go and go on an adventure to, where would that be? It's probably probably New Zealand um, or like down that way anyways, Australia, New Zealand. I've never been and we're hoping that we'll qualify for the World Cup there in 2021. So I think if we got to go on that trip, I'd have to extend it a bit longer to do a bit of travelling. We'll all be going to New Zealand that year. <laughs> Hopefully. On our holidays and supporting the rugby and, and, and then Ulton yourself as well, because, you know, having been born in France and then moved to Ireland and, and then playing uh, rugby with Connacht and, and on the Irish panel as well, you've travelled to 
wide and far across the globe. Where has been the highlight for you in terms of your traveling adventures? Uh, I think we went to South Africa uh, for the 2016 summer tour. We, um, our, our down day was on a Wednesday. So every Wednesday you kind of had, uh, you could do whatever you wanted. And we organized a helicopter ride uh, these these stunt helicopter pilots uh, to fly us to the coast and then um, where boats were waiting to take us out to sea and we got to go shark diving with uh, with great white sharks and uh, the scariest experience of my life but the coolest thing I think I've ever done the, the helicopter alone was unreal and then the the shark diving was insane the scariest thing and that brings me to the next question um, Nicola what's the scariest thing you've ever done in your life Oh God, it's nothing as exciting as that. Um, I don't know. Like I suppose I went in my in like Ty. We went like uh, like cliff like cliff jumping in Ackle. So, like that's as exciting as it gets for me. <laughs> that's uh, pretty scary. I certainly wouldn't do it. What about you, Mona? I don't know. Like I'm a bit of a, I'm a fan of uh, scary stuff. So I'm trying to think of something that um has really well last summer we went on holidays on a family holiday to italy and uh, me and my brother found this um cliff going into like a lagoon area i think it was i think we calculated it was like maybe 13 meters up so we were jumping off that like that's probably the scariest thing i've ever done just the fear of landing the wrong way and it hurting a lot but it was also really fun so i don't know if it counts <laughs> Well, I have yet to jump off the top level of the Black Rock Diving Tower in Salt Hill. That's how scared a cat uh, I am. I wouldn't even do that. Uh, so fair play for doing the, the cliff jumping. Um, in terms of, I suppose, favourite things, and we've touched on this briefly earlier when we talked about your the favourite part of your sport, but I want to talk about like your favourite snacks, the favourite things that you go to um, to enjoy uh, pre or post uh, a match or a race. And we'll start with you, Mona. Um, I just kind of have breakfast before I race and I wouldn't really eat anything after that and that's nothing special but then after after competition the first thing I do is have like a glass of milk and some flapjacks or protein balls my mum makes really good ones uh, so normally I have that like on pool deck so I'm ready to pretty much intake that the minute I get out of my race uh, that's my go-to snack for uh, competition. Nicola? Um, we like before our matches are like carb load would kind of start the day before so um, like we'd always kind of have like high carb meals so like pasta dishes that kind of stuff and then the day of the match I kind of try to keep it kind of simple because I don't want to upset my stomach so I'd usually have like pancakes and a teller or something like that kind of just to fuel me up for the match. <laughs> and Alton? Um, for me I don't need to put on weight I'm still putting on weight so uh the best way for me to do that is to have a shake. This kind of smoothie I have, I have it once or twice a day. It's like a thousand calories. It's a, a peanut butter type of smoothie. It has just oats, hard oats, peanut butter, and a uh, scoop away. And it's, yeah, that would be my favorite snack. And how many calories do you need to consume on the day before or the day of a match to ensure that you're fueled correctly, Alton? Uh, it depends per body weight like, or, or uh, nutritionist all have us eat different things but it's more, it's mainly carbs they want you to get in and hydration but uh i, I would guess double the double your normal amount just okay. to be more energy late game and for you mona is, is there a calorific requirement that you need to have every day um on, on i suppose the days you're not racing or with regards to, to to training um you know do you need to fuel today for tomorrow's session and then after tomorrow's session fuel in recovery for the next day's session um i think like i kind of just go with how i feel i'm kind of lucky that i don't need to be that specific but i don't feel personally i need to um i just go with trying to have enough and not feel stuffed i'd actually coming up to competitions i would probably cut back on how much i eat just because you're cutting down your training load especially within taper so i probably actually eat less um than i would normally just because i'm not working it off uh, but I don't really have any specific numbers. It's pretty much just how I feel. 
Nicola, would you have any uh, rituals or superstitious things that you would do before the day of a big game? Like, would you wear particular socks or would you wear a jersey or a bracelet or do something with your hair uh, to bring you good luck on the day of a game? Uh, I wouldn't say I have like any like superstitions. I'd say more like a, a set routine. So like I'd sit in like a certain part of the bus and listen to my music. And then when I get to the pitch, I try like get out onto the pitch just for like a walk around. And then I come in and kind of get set for the match. But like, I wouldn't have any kind of lucky socks or anything like that. <laughs> what about you, Alton? Um, yeah, no, I don't have many superstitions. Music's the, the big one for me. I listen to loads of different genres of music, but uh, close to the game, I go quite heavy with rock, heavy metal type of stuff. Yeah, because that was going to be my next question. What sort of music do you listen to? And I see Mona is giggling away to herself there. So I want to know what kind of music Mona listens to when she's on the swim deck getting um, riled up and ready to race. Oh, um, it honestly jumps so much. Like, it depends on what um, what I'm into at that time. I love going to, like, throwback songs. I don't know why they just kind of get me in the mood to nearly dance. Um, I always listen to I Could Be The One by Avicii. That's like my last song. That's always the last song I listen to. It kind of like if I hear it out of competition now on the radio or something, I'm nearly like, oh, my God, I need to race because I just like nearly just hear it and immediately think, OK, it's race time. Uh, but apart from that, like I wouldn't even have any rituals or anything either. It's just kind of like a set routine as well. OK, so for the next little section here, I'm going to let you ask each other the questions and I'm going to stay quiet for a minute. So I think I'm going to start with Eeny, Meeny, Miney, Mo. I'm going to start with Ulton. Ulton, have you a question that you want to put to either of the ladies? Uh, yeah, I, I want to ask Mona about her eating requirements, because you hear of the stories of how like Michael Phelps eats, I don't know, is it over 10,000 calories a day? I just thought, was it, is it any different for yourself or? Yeah, well, I'm probably not hitting 10,000 calories, <laughs> but um, I kind of just, I have three big meals, maybe four a day, um, and tend to kind of stuff myself and live in a food coma for the next hour. So, like, I, I would eat a lot more than maybe other swimmers do, but I try and kind of cut back. So, I don't think I eat a crazy amount especially probably you guys looking at it would think I eat nothing compared to what you eat but um I uh, know I don't really have any specific uh targets or anything either do you reckon like long distance swimmers would eat like way more or um that's a good question I would say possibly but then a long distance swimmer wouldn't be as um as built up so then maybe they don't need as much uh fuel because they're a smaller body so that is actually a good question that I can't specifically answer, <laughs> being a sprinter myself. <laughs> and because Alton put you on the spot, Mona, in the first instance, I'm going to let you ask the next the next question. Um, well, I actually, I have two, but I'll ask one and then uh, another <coughs> one afterwards. But I was thinking when you were talking about going out into the rain, how do you manage um, not getting like sick and colds and stuff? Because like if I ever go out, in the rain, I kind of, I'm so warm, I want to run around in shorts and a t-shirt, but at the same time, you know, you have to be careful that you're you're not going to get a, a flu or something from that. Um, yeah, for us, our nutritionist has like, uh, they give us um, multivits, they kind of push them to us every week, reminding us to eat them. I, I suppose it's, it's, the only, it's the only thing they can do to try to prevent that. And they try to stay on top of us eating our veg and, immunity foods you know but uh, otherwise it's i don't know it, people get sick a lot nicola do you want to jump in there and answer that question as well sorry um yeah i suppose for us um it's like you like you go out with your base layers on you kind of put on as many layers as you can and you come off because you're obviously moving but then for us it's about getting straight in and getting hot showers and getting warm again and then usually there's food up in the canteens for us like soup or something like that just to kind of warm us back up again um, but yeah, like we are like S and C and stuff will be pushing us, trying to get us off the pitch as quick as we can. There's no hanging around on those days. Is there ever a battle between, say, the coach who wants you on the pitch, maybe the nutritionist and the S and C who wants you off the pitch and back inside in the warmth? Is there ever a, a combat or a, a conflict between the coaches when you're in, I suppose, inclement weather? 
Nicola, we'll go to you for that. Um, I suppose there probably is times where like maybe the session isn't going to plan and you want to get more reps, but um, we're kind of busy training away. So whether the coaches are having a dispute between them or not, like we don't really see it. We're just going to keep moving and keep warm. So I'm sure there is those days where there's that bit of conflict, but usually um, it gets resolved, I think. And Nicola, we'll allow you to ask a uh, question now to the panel. Yeah, I was going to ask Mona. Um, so what would your like kind of typical like training week be like? Kind of what kind of sessions would you be putting in? Um, I do eight sessions in the water this year. Two of them were long course, so I have to actually travel two and a half hours to get to my nearest long course pool, and then the rest are short course, which is just uh, thirty minutes away. And then I do two gym sessions and one circuit session a week. So that's kind of like my setup. I go from Monday to Saturday and then Sunday is rest day. I'm going to jump in there because I want to ask, um, what's the definition of a short course and a long course in your area of swimming, Mona? Uh, oh, long course is a 50 metre pool. Uh, so that's And then short course is your 25 metre pool. So 50 metre pools are scarce enough in Ireland. <laughs> so it takes a bit of travel to get to one, but well worth it when you get the practice in. And Mona, you had another question. You mentioned you had two questions. So we hand yeah. the floor back over to you again. Uh, well, I was just wondering, like, how does it feel when you have this absolute beast of a person running towards you, uh, pretty much coming probably to knock you down? Um, how, how do you deal with that? Because obviously, being in my own lane, I wouldn't really have any experience with that. My main focus when there's someone running at me like that is like to get them by the ankles, because I wouldn't be like kind of one of the like the biggest or the strongest so the only way to kind of beat them is to get them by the ankles because they fall faster so there was no point trying to go into an arm wrestle with them <laughs> yeah for us uh it, it is really really scary it's as scary as you think it, on, the, on the pitch um but that's what we do all the all the practice for and when you it's, it's like when you get one good tackle on a on a really big player you, you kind of get that belief that that it is a lot of it is in your head and if you hit a person if you hit a big per big person that's running really hard at you, really fast at you if you meet him with a lot of force then you end up not getting that hurt whereas if you go to make a tackle and you make a half attempt and he's got a lot of power coming through to you you're going to get destroyed and it's going to hurt a lot so it's a it's a big mental battle in your own head but uh if you get good at it and you come out on top once or twice, that's switching the flip or flipping the switch, sorry, to, to become a, a good tackler. I'm going to jump back in there, Alton, and talk about the, uh, I suppose, the confidence boost that it is that you get when you do make a tackle uh, and, and what that means for you when you're on the pitch, especially if you're, you know, going on the pitch and, and not sure if you're going to have the best game possible. That kind of confidence boost that it gives you, how important is that? Yeah, no, it, it's huge because uh, it's kind of like putting your marker down on, on the pitch and letting the team know, you know, you're you're you're, you're on form or whatever. Uh, it, it is a it's a it's a big boost not only for yourself but for your rest of your team. So on big on big games like big derby matches, for instance, the first player to 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 make to put that big hit in uh, is is rewarded hugely because the rest of the team is boosted up so uh, so much and. You know immediately when you go to review the game and, and uh, the, on Monday that your defense coach is like you, you get commended for 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 that because that that has such a big effect on the rest of the team. Uh, they're, they're huge moments. How important is that first tackle on the day, Nicola, on a on a big game? Yeah, like it's 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 really important. Like it's kind of the marker that you set for the rest of the game, and like Olsen said, like if one person puts in that big tackle it just instantly like kind of ripples through the team everyone has a bit of more of a pep in their step so like those kind of like first the first like 10 minutes of the matches I think is always kind of I think always a huge part of the game that's going to like kind of unfold. Is there a lot of tension before the game between the players or is it just a lot of nervous energy? I'll jump to you again Nicola. Um, I suppose kind of everyone has their own kind of ways about them whenever they're like whenever we're just about to start the match like you would have girls that are really nervous you have girls that just don't really talk or you have people that kind of talk keep continue talking like it kind of everyone has their own way about them and but like I always find the when I'm playing with Ireland anyway it's the anthem that gets me every time like 
that's whenever it starts to, you start to get I get really nervous anyways um but like everyone has their own way of dealing with it and like but I always think that a little bit of nerves is always good I want to talk briefly about uh, mindset around injuries because as athletes I mean there is a good chance you're going to get injured and we know on the rugby pitch it's very easy to get injured at times and you know you can pull things in the swimming pool as well and um, so Mona how do you deal with injuries from a mental perspective? Yeah it's it's difficult obviously because as an athlete all you want to do is get back racing and be back on top uh, and me as well I just want to get back in uh, and you know start training again so I guess it's just about doing what you can in the moment so when I got sick last year um, I was doing my leaving cert so I just kind of tried to switch concentration to something else but uh, I was also doing a lot more kind of research on my stroke and watching back old races so at least I felt like I was doing something um, towards benefiting me when I could actually get back in the pool but it is it is a hard time because you know there's nothing really you can do about it except just help your body recover um, and I think it's just about trying to the focus away from the negatives and try and put it onto something positive. Um, and so Nicola, in terms of dealing with injury yourself, would you have the same sort of methodology in terms of trying to flip the negative into the positive and come out of a time period where you have an injury stronger and fitter than you were before it happened? Yeah, I definitely think it's really important that you turn it into a positive because it's very easy to kind of dwell on the negative side of things whenever that happens, like not being able to train and not being able to play so like focusing on your rehab and that kind of stuff and making sure your body's right, like they become like your main focuses. And then like like Mona kind of said about what rewatching matches and stuff like that, just like I suppose betting yourself in those kind of ways maybe than actually being on the pitch training, I think it's really important. How critical are you of yourself though when you look back on those matches Nicola and see the little mistakes you know are you very critical of yourself or is it a good thing to do to watch those matches back? Yeah like my parents would always be like oh you had a great match or whatever and I'd be like no nope, it was terrible and I'll like I'll always be harsh on myself but I think you can't ever become complacent in like how you play because there's always someone that's going to be kind of biting at your heels so you always have to have that kind of want and drive to keep wanting to better yourself as much as possible. I'm going to jump across to you, Alton, um, and talk about, you know, that that position that you hold on the team is very important for you because it's your position. But as Nicola mentions, you know, in a team sport, there's always somebody chomping at the bit mm -hmm. to try and grab your position on the pitch, whether it be for Connacht or for the Irish team. How do you deal with the pressure of that and ensuring that when you do go on the pitch or when you're in training, that you do give as best a performance as you can so you keep securing that spot on the starting team every time? Yeah, it's that, that's the difference, I suppose, between you know being a, on a single sport like swimming or, or a team or a team sport like rugby, uh, because you're they're your friends. They're trying to get your position as well, uh, more often than not. Uh, so it, it's it is definitely strange, but you call it healthy competition, and I think that's what I've, I've, that's what we've always had. That's what I've always experienced. I've never been bitter towards any of my teammates uh, who who may have been selected ahead of me. Uh, I think. The competition between between teammates like that is uh, it's it's positive because it's it's trying to bring the best out of out of out of everyone. And uh, if you miss out on your place, it's it's just an opportunity for you to do better. And that's that's why, like Nicola would say, you know, that's why we're that critical on ourselves because there's someone there's someone that you know is good and that's coming after your position, and you're just trying to be the best you can, player you can. And it's hard to have the perfect game. You're always going to have something that you could do better. And uh, that's why I think we're always going to be so so critical. But like our parents and friends are always going to see just those big moments that, oh, that one really good carry or that one really good tackle. And they won't see that you missed like two moments at the start of the game or, you know, fell, fell asleep for a line out or whatever it might be. Uh, but, but, but we'll always remember those. And that's what, that, that what, that's what stayed with us. And I suppose the other side of it as well, and Alton, you mentioned it there in that we see the big moments and you get commended for the big moments. But Mona, what happens when you make a mistake in the swimming pool and your race is, is, is in effect over? You haven't done the strategy that you had. It didn't work. Your own performance, you weren't up for it on the day. 
you know, how do you deal with some of the negative um, feedback that you might get from, say, people who are supporting you or watching you? Or do you ever get any of that negative feedback? Do you ever get that trolling on social media from people? No, I'm so lucky that no, I never have. Everyone behind me is, you know, 100% supporting me. I have, I did go through a phase of, I went to a competition uh, back in 2018 and I was, I built up in my mind that everyone was expecting me to do really, really well. And if I didn't do well, they'd all, but uh, at the end of the day, I came home and no one was really any wiser. I was the only person that knew how well I could have done. They were all just proud of how I did actually do, which to me wasn't great, but to them was still amazing. So I think, you know, for me, it was, it's more the battle of what I think other people are thinking and they're actually not thinking that at all. They're just there to support me and they're hundred percent behind me. Do you think, Mona, as athletes, we're, we're very hard on ourselves and we don't give ourselves an awful lot of credit and we're overly critical? Yeah, I, I think athletes are overly critical and it is, it's a good thing because at least you're constantly striving to be better. Um, but yeah, like there's always, you know, there could be a hundred good things and I think an athlete will always pick the one bad thing and focus on that. Uh, which is, you know, sometimes it's a pain because you might have a really good race uh, and you're just focused on the one thing that didn't go right. But uh, at the end of the day, at least you're going to continue working on making that stronger. So. And Nicola, you know, in a team scenario, do you ever get frustrated with mistakes that other people make or that you might make or, you know, mistakes that a coach might make? They might have made the wrong call for a game or, you know, is that a difficult situation to be in? Yeah, like I think it is very easy to kind of get frustrated, but like we try to just delete anything like that and move on. Like we don't like when you're on the pitch, you don't have to have, like time to be thinking about, oh, I dropped that last ball. That's really annoying. You have to just focus on what's next. And um, so like when you're on the pitch, there's no real time for getting angry about those kind of things. It's about playing what's in front of you. So like, I suppose that's nearly what our review is for. Like kind of if we made the right decision, if we didn't make the right decision and kind of making sure that if that kind of scenario comes up again, that we do make the right decision. But um, yeah, when you're on the pitch, there's not really time for dwelling on things that have just happened. It's all about kind of focusing on going forward. And Ulton, during a game, uh, it, it's very strategic as well. Obviously, there's calls coming from the sideline in a rugby match, but even internally on the pitch yourselves between the players, it's a very strategic game as well on top of all of that. So you're not only are you thinking about running, catching, tackling, but you're also thinking about what's going on around you on the pitch as well. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, you have uh, people, different players have different roles. So naturally, the, the uh, out half... The, and the second rows have a, have a big role to play in that, like, or out has to be the generals, the, the playmakers, the, the pick what roles the backs run. Uh, with the help of their other backs, it's not all on their shoulders. And then us as uh, line-out callers, you know, we have to study with help again with, from, the other, from our team. We uh, analyze the opposition and come up with the right game plan to call the right line-outs in, in different situations on the pitch. So it, it is a lot of pressure on top of the fact that you're, you're trying to beat them up. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and, and keep the ball so I think we're going to finish up in the, and this is going to be my final question and it's uh, it's about self-care and it's about doing the things that you want to do or that you look forward to on your day off and I'm going to start with you Nicola what do you most look forward to on your day off so that you can look after yourself um mine's definitely like just going for a coffee and just having like those kind of like that half an hour just think about other things than just rugby um so like that's probably what my I do on my day off it's just go for coffee and just chill out for a few hours Mona um I think for me it's just about being able to relax without having anything coming up like I know I have 24 hours where I do not need to do anything I don't need to be anywhere in an hour so I think it's just even about not doing anything that's what I like to do with my time off and what about you, Walton? Uh, yeah, I have to agree there as well. I think it's uh, not having to have any structure or schedule in place for a day. I like to not have to wake up at a certain time. I'll still wake up early, but just to not have a schedule to, to adhere to is kind of good. 
just keeping the day nice and fluid, going with the flow and chilling out. It sounds like an absolutely perfect day to me. So that brings to a close our final panel uh, opportunity with Swim Ireland. We play series in partnership with Sport Ireland and Kinetica. I hope you've enjoyed our interviews uh, throughout the series and especially hope you enjoyed our interview today with Mona, Nicola and Ulton. And of course, we will be seeing lots more from them over the weeks and months to come. Stay safe, everybody. And thank you so much for joining us for our We Play series 2020.